Good morning. Happy Sabbath and welcome to the Meridian Seventh-day Adventist Sabbath School. For our online viewers, warm welcome to you. Glad you are joining us. Please uh, get out your Bibles because we are going to be looking at Isaiah chapter 58. And as is the norm uh, when I teach, I like to go to the original text. And uh, you will want to take some notes because there are a few things that are said differently in the original Hebrew than in the translation. So let's bow our heads for a moment of prayer and we'll get straight into the text of Isaiah chapter 58. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that you have allowed us into the divine presence this morning. This is your house. This is your time. We are your people. And we are seeking your face. And so we, we know that you are here. We just pray that during this time we will fully enter your presence and not be somewhere else in our hearts or our minds. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Um, in the recent weeks, we have been examining the question of love. Last time I spoke here, we uh, looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and the word used for love repeatedly is agapain, which means it's a verb, it's active, it's future as well, which means that no matter how our love is received, we keep on loving. And uh, it is singular, which means that we regard every single individual in our interactions with that individual as the only person in the world there is to pour out the love of God on. Uh, agape is a Greek word uh, which is only used in religious writing, which means that this kind of love only comes from God. It is a divine love. It is not something we can practice to, toward people unless the divine person is empowering that love. Um, the reason I bring you back to that is because Isaiah chapter 58 is very much about agape, though Isaiah is written in Hebrew. I'd like you to look at the text with me. I'm reading from the New American Standard and will intermittently share what the Hebrew says. The chapter begins with the words, Cry loudly, do not hold back, raise your voice like a trumpet and declare to my people. So, first of all, when do we come across a trumpet being sounded in Scripture? What is the context? There are probably two. If you've got the answer, put up your hand and we'll get a mic to you. Where, what is the context of trumpets blowing in Old Testament times? Okay, Mel, Mel needs a microphone. And I'd like you to be thinking of the general context of, of the chapter after that. Yes, Mel. Call to worship. And to Call war. to worship. And to That's war. That's one. There are another two. And to war. To war, according to, to battle. What else? That's two. That's two. <laughs> okay, it's, it's, it's also the, the, the announcement of victory. Okay, so it's worship. It's the context of worship, war, or battle, conflict, 
and the issue of ultimate victory. So we need to understand Isaiah chapter 58 in those contexts. Declare to my people their transgression and to the house of Jacob their sins. Oh boy, we are in trouble. Because as conscientious Christians, and I don't care whether you are Baptist, from the brethren, from the uh, and, uh, uh, Assemblies of God Church, Roman Catholic, um, LDS, Seventh-day Adventist, no matter what your faith fellowship is, you, number one, begin from the position that you believe yourself to be from the people of God. And it's everybody else outside of your faith fellowship that is in uh, transgression of the Word of God, not us, surely. So Isaiah doesn't mix words. He says, don't look elsewhere, look at yourself. This, this is an issue dealing with those who believe that they are separated from the rest of the faith community because of their faithfulness to God. And to the house of Jacob, of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me day by day and delight to know my ways. There we go. This uh, excuse to everybody. We as Seventh-day Adventists are very conscious of the belief that we have the truth. There's a danger of walking around with spiritual pride because we have understandings of Scripture that maybe not everybody else has. And so this fits us. We delight to know your ways. There's a difference between knowing God's ways and what? Living God's ways. It's not good enough just to know how to eat right. It's not good enough just to know what happens when a person dies. It's not good enough to know how Jesus will come again. It's not just good enough to know which day is the day that God calls on us to set aside for worship. We've got to live the Word of God. Knowing is not enough. As a nation that has done righteousness and has not forsaken the ordinance of their God, they ask me, for just decisions. They delight in the nearness of God. And then verse 3. We're coming to a parallel now with, an, with one of my favorite verses that I have kept sharing with you of late. We, why have we fasted and thou dost not see? Ever felt that way? You've been faithful, you've done the right things, you've believed the right things, and yet when we get on our knees, we have this terrible sense that God's not seeing our situation. Where is my recompense and reward? There you go. Where is it? Where are you, God? I'm alone in this, on this issue. Remember Psalms chapter 23, verse 1, does not read as the translation does. It does not read, the Lord is my shepherd. It reads, Yahweh Roy, I shall not want. God sees me, so therefore I have no need. When God sees his child, he meets every need we have, doesn't he? The problem is we don't always feel that God sees us. And, and so Isaiah raises this himself. 
Thou, um, why have we fasted and you do not see? Why have we humbled ourselves and you do not notice? Now, there's a word there, right there, that brings us to a feast day in the Old Testament, a time when Israel would humble itself before God. Which feast was that? Turn with me quickly. Keep, keep your place at, at uh, Isaiah chapter 58. And let's go quickly to Isaiah, I mean to Leviticus chapter 16. Leviticus chapter 16. The sons of, um, of Aaron had uh, died uh, in the presence of God. God sets up the Day of Atonement, a time that lasted a build-up of 10 days, like we are having 10 days of prayer each evening. You don't want to miss it. Um, there was a 10-day build-up to the Day of Atonement, and uh, two goats were brought. Remember that? One goat was slain for the, uh, as a symbol of Christ who would die for the, the forgiveness of sins of those who accept him. And there was another goat identified as having to take responsibility for leading Israel into sin. I, I can't help myself, uh, forgive me, but please look at uh, Leviticus chapter 16, verse 16. Thirty years ago, there would have been some who would have called out heresy. Leviticus chapter 16, verse 16. Your translation reads, and he shall make atonement for the holy place. The word place does not appear in the original Hebrew, which means the word holy is what? A noun. It is not an adjective. And every time, except for one exception, which we deal with today, every single time the word holy appears in the noun form in Old and New Testament, it is talking about God himself. So atonement was made for not a certain place in the sanctuary, but for what? Who's atonement made with? God. We need to be one with God, not one with a place, but one with God. Uh, and the Hebrew word there is kadoesh, ka ha ha hakodesh, sorry. HaKodesh. Okay, back to so, so this fasting of Isaiah 58 is uh, connected with uh, Leviticus chapter 16 in the Day of Atonement. And then, then he goes in. Well, well let's uh, finish the, the text. Behold, on the day of your fast, you find your desire and drive hard all your workers. And then Isaiah lays out the problem that God gives to us. Behold, you fast for what? What's the next word there? If you, if, if you think of the Lord's Supper, Paul says there are many who, who die early and, and are unnecessarily sick. Now let's remember, just because we're sick doesn't mean to say we've done anything against God. Jesus makes that clear in the Gospels. But sometimes we are sick unneedlessly for what reason? For those who participate in Lord's Supper in a certain attitude, why, why are there health issues? Because we're, according to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, because when they come together to celebrate Lord's Supper, they come to fight with each other. They don't come for love and unity. 
Now, uh, in three weeks and two days, they're going to drill two holes in my head. Um, somebody came to me and said that I would never have had Parkinson's if I was vegan. Um, I, I do eat generally a very healthy diet, but I can assure you my surgery will not be taking place because maybe once a week I have a fried egg or some scrambled egg. It, it's come about because I had three major blunt force injuries to my head. The last one, my first camp meeting in which Anthony Thompson, who's with us today, hauled me off to hospital and I had about three months of brain rehab to get my balance back and my short-term memory. Remember that, Anthony? Uh, Michael, Mike, yeah. Not, not all ill health is a result of lifestyle, okay? So, so, things happen, but they, that's a second reason. And third reason is God has a problem with us using church and religion as an excuse for contention. And uh, last Sabbath, um, where I preached, one, one man uh, walked out of the service at the end of the, ser the, the service and didn't say a word to anybody. He was, he was angry because he makes it a point to uh, pray against, daily he prays against abortionists. Well, without going into the issue of abortion, I pray that God will bless abortionists. And here's my reason. When God puts his blessing on a person, no matter who they are or what they're wrongdoing, when, when the blessing of God is at work, what happens to the person? Changes. I don't, you know, like Daniel, I don't want those in conflict with God to be under a curse. I want them to be under the blessing of God strong enough that they start thinking and doing and living what God wants of them. And I cannot win a person to God by fault finding and criticism, but I can win a person to God through. A, an ongoing, God-given, active love that loves into the future, irrespective of how they treat me. And so I cannot pray against any politician. I cannot pray against any ideology. I cannot pray against any religion. All I can do is, as a child of God is to pray for those who need the blessing of God, because when the blessing of God is poured out, things change in their lives. And this is one of the things that Isaiah is trying to communicate. So he says our problem is um, we fast for contention and strife to strike with a wicked fist. You do not fast like you do today to make your voice heard on high. Is it a fast like this which I have chosen a day for a man to humble himself? For it, it, is it for bowing one's head like a reed and for spreading out sackcloth and ashes as a bed, will you call this a fast, even acceptable to the Lord, to Yahweh? And here's his answer to, to true fasting. Verse 6, is, not the, is, not, is this not the fast which I choose to loosen the bonds of wickedness? Now, here's another time to step on toes. I watch my brothers and sisters and myself. And by brothers and sisters, I mean all people that call themselves children of God, whether they are Adventist or non-Adventist, whether they are Christian or non-Christian. If a person calls themselves a child of God, 
I have this issue. When a political party is in power, or a president is in power from a political party, and that political party disagrees with me, or does not have my vote, everything they do is wrong. And then another party comes in, another person comes in, and they do the same thing, and then suddenly everything they do is right. Have you noticed that? I'll take one issue. Going into further debt, national debt. One year, some of us will be totally in favor of going into deeper debt, and then the next year, suddenly, we think it's the worst thing under creation. You know what I mean? Now, pay attention to Isaiah. Is this not the fast which I choose? To loosen the bonds of wickedness, to undo the bands of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free? Is it not to divide your bread with the hungry? Now, I don't care whether you look after the uh, fringes of society through paying higher taxes and do it through the government, or you pay lower taxes and do it through your pocket directly. That's your choice. But as a child of God, you should want to see that we look after the hungry, the naked, the destitute, and anybody on the fringes of society, irrespective of who is in power, yes or no? Yes. Isaiah says in Isaiah 58 that, that God holds us accountable for looking after the oppressed. And whenever there is a, a falling away, a backsliding from the faith, he, he, God points Israel back and says, how are you treating the alien? How are you treating the orphan? How are you treating the widow? How are you treating the hungry? And so Moses even had laws that if you were a farmer and your crop was reaped, you were to leave some of your crop behind in the field so that the poor and the needy would be able to come and do their own harvest even though they own nothing. And we find all kinds of excuses to get out from that responsibility and we, we use political and philosophical argument to excuse ourselves. Yes. God is no respecter of party, of philosophy. Oh. As I was studying that the, this week, it hit me in a different way. Isaiah 58 is a really um, a personal for, a chapter for me. And as I was reading this, this um, this last week, it came to me as, as in addition to mm -hmm. feeding and clothing, it talks about to loose the bonds of wickedness, which basically is to, to do away with sin, to get yes. rid of the, the, the sin problem. So feed, sharing the bread is sharing our, sharing Jesus, sharing who we know. It's, it's that we may die in this world, but mm -hmm. if we have Jesus, that sin problem is done away with, and we are going to live forever with him. Uh, absolutely. I, it just hit me so yeah. first time, and it was just like, oh, every time we, we look into his word. we. Uh, and in about two, three minutes, we're going to tr transition into that side as we get onto the day of, of the fast. And th thank you so much, Sherry. Yes, there's a spiritual component which we will build up on in, in a few moments here. Um, so if, 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 we, if we take care of the, of the fight against sin, and, the, and the, the last part of the chapter deals with how the fight against sin occurs. Um, there's another hand, uh, Marilyn. 
Um, I, I also love Isaiah 58. One time after a difficult surgery and recovery, I delved into Isaiah 58 and found a lot of blessing. But one of the words that troubled me was to undo the heavy burdens and let the oppressed go free that break every yoke. Later in Isaiah, it talks about the yoke being the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness. Yes. And all of a sudden, God touched my heart with my need to, uh, to stop putting people in boxes. She's critical. Yes. She's yeah. this. He's that. And to break every yoke meant to release them from those boxes, to feed them with mercy and, and grace that God heaps on me. So all of a sudden, it allowed me to see this wasn't a, just the yoke of sin. This was the yoke that I create in my mind towards other people. Yes, and, and the yoke of guilt that people carry because right. of broken relationship with each other. Right, so pointing Thank the you. finger, speaking and, and, and last night at the 10 days of prayer, which is 6 o'clock each evening, starting up again mm -hmm. tomorrow evening, uh, Sherry shared that we should not point the finger, and she said because three or four point back to us. And I, I looked at her pointing the finger as a demonstration and said, no, three are pointing back to us. One is pointing to God. When we, when we are caught in accusing others and fault-finding, we are, we are basically accusing God for not having control of the situation because if he were in control of the situation, we wouldn't have this problem with you. Right? Okay, and, and we're we, we, we coming shortly to, to the power for, for this uh, witness. Okay, so, so if we will we'll take care of, of the burdens of people, the spiritual, the, the material, uh, the social burdens of people, then God's promises, then your light, verse 8, will break out like the dawn, and your recovery will speedily spring forth, and your righteousness go before you. At some point, we need to look at the meaning of righteousness in, as defined by Scripture. Remember, we have discussed what the meaning of perfection is when Jesus says, Be ye therefore perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. What is that perfection? It is in our equal love towards everybody. We are to treat everybody with agape love. We are to treat them with respect, with a preference. We are to hold, lift everybody up and not have favorites. And that's the biblical definition of perfection. It is not that we eat right every Sabbath potluck. That is not perfection. That is a mockery of perfection. Perfection is learning to love others as God loves us. And that's only something God can do. To, today we deal with something that is, that is about holiness. Um, and you can read the promises through verse 12. Verse 13. Let's look at this now. We're coming to another term where there's needless argument within the community of faith at large and within ours in particular. Verse 13. If because of the Sabbath you turn your foot from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, and now I'm switching to a direct translation of the Hebrew, and you follow in the, your translation, and call the Sabbath a delight, um, the Holy of Yahweh. Please turn to Nehemiah. Keep your finger there. Turn to Nehemiah. 
chapter, seven, chapter 9, verse 14. Okay, Ezra, Nehemiah, if you get to Job, you've uh, passed it. Nehemiah, Nehemiah, (laughs) chapter 9. I'm working from a fairly new Bible and doesn't turn easily like my older one. Nehemiah, I'm going the wrong direction, okay. Nehemiah 9, verse 14. So thou didst make known to them the Sabbath thy holy. That's how it reads in the Hebrew. Remember, uh, anyone who's studied Greek or Hebrew in college, First lesson, pay very close attention to the order that words appear in the text because those, the order will identify for you what is the noun and the adjective. We've already learned as a congregation that there are several things that can be holy, a place, a time, a person, or a thing if it is in the presence of God. But only God is holy. God is the sole holy. Uh, When Stephen preaches at his uh, martyrdom, he says, you crucified your holy. Not your holy one. The word one is an addition. You crucified your holy. You crucified your God. Okay, in the noun form, holy is always God. Not just his name, not just his character. It is God. It is the quintessential identification of God. And there are only three holies, which should tell us something. But a priest can be sanctified as holy. A people can be sanctified as holy. A place can be sanctified as holy. This church was dedicated a few years ago. It was sanctified as a, as a place of worship once the bill was paid. Okay? However, the Sabbath is the one exception, and there are only two texts, and we are looking at both of them. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 14. God identifies the Sabbath as being on a level with himself. Because in time, place, person, and thing, they all come together in the Sabbath. And it is as if God materializes in our presence even though we don't see him. When we come here to worship, Not for contention, but when we come in mutual love to worship and we recognize that we are walking into the presence of God, we are in the presence of holiness. Do you get that? There is only one way I can be holy. A burning bush can be holy when God is in the burning bush. Ten years later, you go back to that very spot and you don't have to take off your sandals because it is no longer holy because God is not there. God says, be ye therefore holy. The only way I can be holy is to be in the immediate presence of God. I cannot be holy by my action. I can only be holy in the immediate presence of God, recognizing his presence. The fact is, when I'm in the immediate presence of God, there are certain things that I'm not interested in doing anymore. And certain things take care of themselves, correct? Okay, so with that understanding, 
Let's go to verse 13 again. If because of the Sabbath you turn your foot from doing your pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of Yahweh, honorable and shall honor it, and shall honor it. The word there in Hebrew is not it. It is him. And shall honor him, desisting from your ways. What are my ways? My ways are contentious. My ways are selfish. My ways are of self-interest. From seeking your own pleasure and speaking your words, then you will take delight in the Lord and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth and I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father for the mouth of Yahweh has spoken. How do we, the context gives the answer, how do we release the bands of oppression of people? Okay, we've, we've covered, we need to meet them at the point of their need. But how do we, how do we find the energy and the, and the time and, and the will to do that? How do we, as, as Sherry was saying, how do we meet the needs of people in a social, spiritual way? Marilyn. I would say by being holy, and that would involve, yes, the only way we can be holy, and I loved what you just said, is the indwelling presence of God within us. Because humanly speaking, my husband and I had this conversation this morning, I'm always right, and I know it. Yeah. And, <laughs> and so as you were talking about politics and everything, there's so much anger and animosity. Yeah. I keep very quiet at work because yeah. it can create such a um, yoke, a yeah. burden. And yet, if the, if, as you said, something is holy only when God's presence is there. That to me is a beautiful thought that when God said, be holy as I am holy, he was inviting us to say, Lord, fill me, dwell yeah. in me. Be a part of me. And when I'm living like that, then moments are created when people feel the love of God by my presence. It's not because I'm good. Yeah. But it, it's just, it blows my mind. I love it. I love it. So. Yeah. Um, uh, yes, Mike. Oh, I wanted to go back to yes. your, something you said about the Sabbath and pointing out the Sabbath and Nehemiah 9, 14, and here in Isaiah 58. Is there any indication here in the text, and maybe we pointed that out earlier in reference to the Day of Atonement, is there any indication here in the text that uh, this particular Sabbath that is being mentioned is that of one of the feast days or the creation Sabbath? Uh, yes, in that uh, both were periods of fasting. Uh, both were periods of humbling themselves. Um, both s struggled with the issue of people uh, being holy on, on the occasion rather than throughout the year or, or the period. Um, there, I had a relative who, who was Adventist whose husband was non-Adventist, and she loved the arrangement because she could be holy. She could keep the Sabbath, but her husband could do the grocery shopping. <laughs> it was a marvelous arrangement. Um, yeah, there, there, there are those indications. Uh, the, 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 the consensus of scholars is uh, that this was not the, to, talking specifically about the seventh day Sabbath, which appears every week, but a feast day. And uh, 
I, I personally believe it's, it has dual application. Um, the, on, on what uh, Marilyn said, you know, I attended a meeting some time, and I'll keep this very short, we've got about three minutes. Um, I attended a roundtable discussion with some community leaders uh, around September last year, and there was a coach from Boise State University there. Uh, he, he was African American and he had to leave the meeting early and he, he stood up and uh, asked to be excused and then thanked the mayor for showing respect. And then he said, um, I want to thank Pastor Pearson for loving me. I've never felt more loved ever in my life than I have right now. Uh, I once walked into the uh, city hall and interacted, just asked a few questions from the lady in re at reception she, uh, we had never met before. And I said, thank you, and turned to go, and she made the comment. She said, thank you so much for coming in today. I have been so richly blessed by your being here. Yesterday, um, I tried to get onto my credit card to pay my bill online, and I missed an upper casing in my password and froze me out. So I clicked on the thing which said, ask for help. And uh, I did that, and a second later, there was a guy named Aaron who responded from uh, Capital One. And uh, he helped me through the problem. And then, then uh, he said, anything more I can help you with? And I said, no, uh, thank you. I think I've got it. Blessings. And moments later, the, he came back and he said, why are you? How, how come you uh, wishing me blessings? You know, so I started to respond to him and his company cut him off. You know, but our goal should be that, that all we interact with, starting with our nuclear family, going to our faith community, our faith fellowship, then our faith community, then to everybody in, in the community, whether visible or invisible. We need to get to a place that our very presence with them gives them a sense that the presence of God is with them. And, and, and this is the most powerful way to lift the yoke mm -hmm. on people. Mm -hmm. That they know that God saw them today because they interacted with the child of God. Mm -hmm. And that argument, not telling people that they keep the wrong day, there's a time and place for that. Not telling people it's, it's good to eat healthy. Not telling people whatever. Those, those all have their place and their time. But that in our interactions with everybody, there's a realization that God is alive. And he visited me today because one of his children interacted with me. And that is the fast that God has chosen. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the divine presence. Um, we pray continually that when people set foot on this property, 
that they know the presence of God is with them and our, our friends next door, uh, some of them have recognized your presence here. But Father, wherever we are, with, with all our interaction with people, whether they are extremely um, blessed with material things or whether they can hardly scrape enough food together for the next meal, that in all our interaction, people will know that there just has to be a God of love because they met and interacted with one of his children who looks and behaves just like him. I pray that you will give us the change we need and enable us to wrap ourselves around the foot of the cross and lock arms together so that your circle will not be broken, but will grow wider and wider without leaving the cross by even an inch. In Jesus' name.